Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another service seminar here at Beaver Coach Sales and Service. We're here with Sean Lakin, our service manager, our fixed ops manager. He does a little bit of everything here at Beaver Coach Sales. Sean, how long have you been coming to this address for employment over the years? Oh, geez, since uh, 1993. What a coincidence, because I was born in 92. <laughs> I was wondering why we didn't hang out earlier in yeah, life. Yeah, it seems strange that we didn't know each other sooner, <laughs> but you were an infant at the time. Uh, it makes It would have been weird, so yeah, I'm glad that weird. things worked out the way that it did. Well, Sean is one of my good friends, and we've been working here together at Beaver Coach Sales and Service for about six years now together. He was here in what five different names or five different businesses under this building at least so he's seen a little bit about uh, a little bit of of everything here and with that he's one of the guys when you call in and you have a question which seems to happen all the time people consider us to be a bit of a, an authority in the industry not just on on used beaver rvs but all the products that we carry and with that sean services I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of phone calls a day. And what's happened is he's kind of compiled what are the, the frequently asked questions. And the effort here for if you're, you're, you're watching this and, and one of these questions pops up, it, it might may be able to answer that question or help you have an understanding how to use it. Because I think what we're discovering is that there, a lot of people own these, don't know a lot about them from the standpoint of, of things that would could be considered to be simple simple in your world but unless you've been taught or shown this or unless they got a really good walkthrough orientation when they purchased their rv uh, there's a lot of this that's that's up for question and that we want to kind of shed some light on that so sean what are we doing here uh well right now we're in uh in our production facility this is going to be our our meeting area slash video production area um, we're in construction right now. As you noticed, we don't have any windows. <laughs> well, there's windows, but there's no glass in any of them. And yeah. uh, we're staring at some uh, some bare plywood. And uh, yeah, no no lighting installed yet, but yep. we're just, we're working on it. So hopefully uh, as we come out with some more of these videos, uh, we'll be in a, a little bit more completed facility. And so, yeah, we're just kind of winging it today. Yeah, that's this right. Is... You're seeing this. So what was the only uh, unavailable or open room in the whole building? Oh yeah. It was our unfinished conference center. So you get, yeah. Getting Next. space here is very difficult. <laughs> that's right. Where there's no, no noise or everyone's working hard. So. Yeah. So thank you for bearing with us. Well, let's just dive right into it, Sean. Yeah, let's go. So let's talk a little bit about uh, before you you take off. It's It's been a long winter here. People are getting their RVs ready for spring and ready to go on trips. Uh, tightening RV lug nuts and checking tire pressure. What does that process look like in your world? So as far as tightening the lug nuts, not a lot of, of folks have the tools that are necessary to put the amount of torque on the lug nuts to get them up to the factory specifications. I know that on a lot of vehicles, you'll see small tags or you'll see a little excerpt with an asterisk in the owner's manual that says owner's responsibility to tighten lug nuts. That is purely uh, for liability purposes. And I don't think really anybody expects you as a <laughs> consumer to put you know 550 to 650 foot pounds of torque on a lug nut. Uh, we have specialized equipment that does that. Uh, it's calibrated uh, annually or semi-annually. Um, and yeah, that's something that we do. Uh, but it, the, the things that you can do, uh, looking at the tire condition, uh, checking the wear pattern, make, making sure that the wear pattern on the tire is even, making sure that the tire inflation is proper to either the data tag or the weight of the vehicle, and then consulting the tire manufacturer's chart. You can do those things. You can look at the sidewalls of the tire and make sure that there's no big cracks or checks in them or big chunks of tire missing. Things of that nature, the average person can do. And and that's kind of what you're after is just making sure that if you're going to put your coach out on the road, that, you know, the tires are in good condition. And also there's a date code uh, section on the tire as well. You can tell exactly when it was manufactured. By date code, most manufacturers will put your tires at a date if they're older than six years old. So no matter what the condition of the tire looks like, they have been breaking down from the time that they were created. And so therefore running them past six years could possibly put you in a bad situation. Now and six our, years real quick because this comes up all the time is it six years front six years rear six years on the tag it's six years period like all the they way don't, around yeah no matter the condition even if you put brand new tires on your coach and you go park it you know off in your garage somewhere mm -hmm. and you don't drive it for seven years your tires are out of date six year shelf life 
So yeah, six year shelf life. Yeah. Okay. And the sun is terrible on tires like it is on, on a lot of other things, like it is on your roof and your paint job and everything else. And that's why they sell these nifty little tire covers. And and the primary purpose of those is basically to keep the sun off the tires so it doesn't degrade the sidewalls of the tires and accelerate basically the you know, the life cycle of your tires. Mm-hmm. Okay, and now do they need to rotate their tires? Absolutely. I mean, it's a good idea. You know, I, I always say, you know, a good rule is every second or third oil change, you should be looking at rotating your tires. Okay, and you figure most people either do your, their annual. They're probably doing their annual. Yeah. So, yeah, every other Put year, 5, I would rotate the tires. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's going to increase your tire life, you know, and then it also too exposes any issues. Uh, if you do have like a chunk of a tire missing on an inner duel, the odds of you ever seeing it are probably approaching zero. Mm -hmm. um, but if they break the, the rear axle down, pull the outside tire off, somebody's going to see it when they're doing the rotation. So now from a safety standpoint, you, you've seen tire blowouts happen. What happens generally if a tire blows on the, the rear axle, either the, the tag or, or rear, and what happens when the tire blows on that front axle? Uh, on a rear axle, uh, on a tire that's even at zero pressure or if it's it's blown, if you didn't hear it go, the odds are pretty good if the tire stayed together, you may not even know that it's bad. Um, the only time that uh, an, it, like an inner rear tire uh, blowing that you'll notice it is maybe performance issues. It feels a little soft in the back end. You go into a corner, you kind of feel it drift in a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's a good indicator that maybe you've got a low tire or, you know, a damaged tire on the rear axle. Um, if it's, if it stays together, that that's it. You probably will notice some really weird wear and some really weird performance and handling characteristics. Mm -hmm. If it comes apart, you're going to hear it because it's going to beat up against the bottom of the coach and take out the wheel well and any wiring or pneumatic, you know, lines that are run for airbags and suspension and stuff like that. Very similar with the outside uh, dual. If it goes, you know, there's going to be some, you know, airbag damage, probably wheel well damage, some of the the outside body fascia damage, things of that nature. You're, if one goes, you're probably not going to experience, you know, uh, uh, real heavy pulling towards the ditch or towards the, the center line. Uh, the vehicle will still remain fairly controllable. If you lose both of them, that's a, a different issue. Rarely would you ever lose both tires on the same side of a rear axle. Uh, the front is a little bit different. Uh, if you lose a front tire, you are definitely going to experience uh, some control issues. Uh, it's going to be hard to maintain uh, that vehicle on the road. I mean, the best thing to do is is don't panic. Try to pick a good line to get out of traffic. And, you know, don't approach a steep shoulder at a hard angle, things of that nature. Try to keep the vehicle, slow it down proportionally. You know, don't panic brake, things of that nature. Things like that seem to, to immediately make the situation worse. There are some products out there um, that help with front tire blowouts. There are some steering uh, stabilizing and assist systems so that the, the vehicle, if it blows a front tire, it won't have the, uh, the effect of jerking the wheel out of your hands and pulling you into the shoulder or pulling you into the center line. Uh, Safety Plus, Steer Safe, there's a bunch of stuff out there like that. Um, there's a product called Tyron that actually goes in and fills the gap in the rim that is necessary to mount the tire so that if a tire does blow and loses its cap or the tread portion, the tire uh, can't get off the rim. So whatever's left of that tire stays with the rim, makes the unit a little bit more controllable, allows you to get out of traffic, allows you to get off the shoulder of the road uh, without having those those real drastic uh, pulls in either direction. So that's something to think about as well. And Shu in our finance department, he sells a lot of that Tyron material because I mean, it is a, it is a safety piece. And I know we're not saying this with tires to scare you, especially if you're you don't own an RV and you're thinking about getting one or you, you currently own one and, and had no idea about, you know, concerns with tire blowouts. All this is just, just to help educate you to make sure that you're a safe, educated consumer when using your product, whether it's class A, class C, uh, motorhome. And with that said, we actually have a, a little clip from Shu explaining a little bit more about Tyron. So let's transition over there and we'll be back in a minute. Hi, today we're going to be talking about Tyron Safety Bands, which is a, a band that is designed to keep the tire on the wheel in the event of a tire blowout or tire-related issue. 
This is a display showing the tie run band mounted to the tire on the wheel. Now the way that wheels are manufactured is they all will have a, a depression in the rim because you have to uh, be able to get the bead of the tire onto the rim because the bead of the tire is smaller than the circumference of the wheel itself. So the way that the tire is mounted once the, the uh, band is on is that the bead goes in and then the tire company rolls the tire onto the rim. So in this, in this case, this band, or this belt, excuse me, allows a channel for the tire or the, the bead to fall into in the event of a flat. So if you're traveling down the road and you hit something in the road, have a valve stem uh, loosen up and lose air. If you lose air pressure, the weight of the coach will push the tire down, the, the bead will drop into that channel and the tire can come off the wheel. So to prevent that from happening, we mount a band inside the rim that fills that cavity. And by filling that cavity, it stands up slightly and the bead itself will hit that band, keeps the tire on the rim, and prevents the tire from coming off. That also prevents the wheel from making contact with the asphalt. So at that point, the tire will go flat, but you can still steer, you can brake safely, and find a safe place to get off of the road. You're not always able to just pull over. Sometimes you have to drive a distance to find a safe place to exit the roadway. So that will allow you to do that without running on the rim, without creating any more damage and tearing up the coach because of a shredded tire. So if you want to look in here, I don't know if you can see it, but you'll see how that band mounts inside and it stands up slightly so that either the bead will hit the band. If it does pop over the band, it still is high enough to where the tire will not come off the rim. So it's really designed just for safety. It doesn't make the coach perform any differently. Uh, it doesn't make it prettier. It's just inside the wheel, sleeping there, and it's there in the case of an emergency. Awesome, so that's a really good option to put on your, your RV that Tyron has saved lives before. Okay, let's transition to the next piece here. Thank you for that. Anything else on tires before we go? Uh, no, that's, that, I mean, the other the it. other component was basically alignment, and oh. that, that kind of leads into tire wear and, and steerability yeah, and stuff. Yeah, let's talk but, about that before we, before we jump on to the next thing. So, yeah, uh, alignment is important. Uh, these coaches are big and heavy, and they're kind of hard to control, especially in ruts or windy conditions or accounting for the crown of the road. They'll have little pushes and pulls in this direction or that. You can tell uh, very quickly um, by looking at the front tires and the rear tires uh, if you're having issues with, with alignment because uh, they will be very evident in the tire wear. Front tires, usually if they wear on the outside, that means that the toe may be slightly excessive. You will notice more wear on the outside of the front tires because they are towed inboard. And what that does is that just gives the coach some direction going down the road. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't want to push to the left. It doesn't want to push to the right. It stays pretty well centered, rides the ruts. That's what toe is for, right? If for some reason that's off, you, what you might see, or if the rear uh, axle is off, what you might see is you might see wear on the inside of one tire and the outside of another. And that's basically the coach pushing down the road, uh, exaggerated uh, sideways, so dog tracking of the rear end, things of that nature. Uh, so yeah, just align me real quick. If you're gonna put new tires on your coach, I would put the new tires on your coach and then immediately go in and get it aligned because that's gonna save you money in the long term because uh, tires are very expensive. Right. As people that have bought some know, yes. you know, it can be six, seven, eight thousand dollars for uh, a set of RV tires. So if you can prolong their life, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely a, uh, alignment's a good investment. At the same time, I mean, what what kind of shop bills have you seen in body damage of people who have not made the investment of upgrading tires? A tire has blown, they've it caused some damage to the RV. I mean, what are some what have you seen that range from in costs? Typically, uh, front tire blowout, uh, not counting tow bills and and things of that nature, sure. just in in body shop and repair, sure. we're anywhere from twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. Rears are a little bit less, or ten to twelve thousand dollars. And tires, six to eight thousand. Right. Yeah. So, so they're it's, a good it's worth making that investment. You know, it's sometimes you look at the price of doing something and not the cost of it if you don't. And tires is a great example of that. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, great. Okay, this next one is a this is a hot topic right now. I feel like the big space race right now is energy and how to store it and how long it lasts. So let's talk about RV batteries. There is a huge 
I mean, scope of RV batteries, it seems like. And there's everyone's got a, a different opinion on how long they last and which ones are better than others. And uh, let's just dive right into that. What's your thoughts on RV batteries? Uh, when should you look at replacing them? How long are they going to last for dry camping? Those kind of things. So, yeah. So, there's there are different types of batteries. Uh, primarily and probably the one that is uh, most prevalent in the industry and the automotive industry as well is the the lead acid battery mm -hmm. um, and those basically are their their plates that are suspended in uh, acid solution and that's how you produce your power um, most of them uh, in the RV industry if you're looking at house batteries they're serviceable meaning that they require maintenance you have to open the caps uh, check the water levels, make sure that they're properly filled, make sure that they're properly charged. And the reason that you want to make sure that they're properly charged is if you're in a cold environment and a battery is in a low state of charge, it'll freeze. Great, uh, batteries that are in uh, a high state of charge, they, it takes a lot, uh, a lot more uh, to freeze them. In other words, the temperature has to be much, much lower in order for a, a fully charged battery to freeze. Uh, freezing will damage them in that, uh, you know, as the water expands, as it freezes, it, it damages the plates, damages the connections, it, it, it will bulge the battery cases and things of that nature. Um, so on the flip side, you, you have lead acid batteries that are non-serviceable. Those are typically a starting battery. Um, you basically, every three to five years, you're probably going to have to replace your starting battery. Um, there are some, some products that you can use to make sure that they're charged throughout the season if you're storing them. Uh, there are some small uh, standalone battery chargers, trickle chargers, to make sure that they stay up. The hardest thing on any battery, doesn't matter what kind it is, is to be left in a low state of charge for extended periods of time. It causes a, a condition called sulfation. Uh, the batteries will never really get back up to their full operating potential, and basically at that point they need to be replaced. And we've seen that on, I mean, the gear old batteries before, you know, it doesn't matter oh, yeah. how old they are. If, if they run all the way dead and you can't get them back up, I mean, it's, they're, they're pretty much toast. And with that lead acid, I, one observation I've made with it, manufacturers when they're building these RVs, a lot of them don't consider how hard it is to get to the tops of these batteries for putting water into them. And there's a product that I know we've added on multiple, multiple RVs. Uh, you wanna explain that? Yeah, so there are different manufacturers of battery watering systems. Uh, they're pretty neat. Uh, basically, if you can carry a, a space for a, a gallon of distilled water in your basement somewhere, uh, you just, uh, have a little pump if you're familiar with like an outboard motor there's a small yeah. little ball pump and you put the uh, the supply end into a can of distilled water you hook up this little tube do a quick disconnect and then you pump it um, there are some floats inside these assemblies that rise with the level of the water and as soon as that cell has taken enough water to become full it shuts off the supply and then it'll fill the next one the next one the next one subsequently when the ball becomes difficult to mm -hmm. depress your battery's full really neat product like ryan was saying access on all these things is not great uh you know uh six uh standard like little u2200 batteries they weigh like 70 pounds a piece mm -hmm. i mean so you're talking about having to move hundreds of pounds of batteries in and out to service them uh so yeah it's a good idea it's a it's a convenience that's uh definitely worth the money yeah, I can see how that's definitely a big advantage, especially if you're in an awkward spot in an RV. Yeah, and they're easy to, to use. That battery. So thanks for doing that. that that's, a, that's a great example there. Then secondly, uh, the second type of batteries is going to be an AGM battery. AGM battery works on the same principle as a uh, lead acid battery in that it is a lead acid battery, except for the, the solution, the the acid is suspended inside a, a glass material, like a fiberglass material, a mat. And so that battery does not require uh, direct maintenance. In other words, it has no caps. Um, you can't add water or solution to the, to the battery at all. Um, basically, uh, they'll last whatever their service life is to the degree that you take care of them. Uh, some of the AGM batteries, you can put them into a mode through the inverter where it'll it'll charge them at a very high rate if there's any kind of sulfation in them. It'll get rid of it and burn it off. Uh, Lifeline batteries will allow you to do that. Um, some of the other manufacturers don't recommend it just because it generates a lot of heat. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but AGM batteries are, are a good choice if maintenance, you know, is, is a concern and you don't want to get into filling those batteries on a regular basis and taking care of them. Uh, you still need to, to watch for things like cracked cases or corroded connections or things of that nature. But for the most part, AGM batteries, if well-maintained, are maintenance-free. And now when we hear deep cycle, because that comes up a lot, is that lead acid? Is that... A deep cycle with uh, gel AGM is it? Just deep a- cycle is more about the construction of the battery itself. Uh, a starting battery is meant to be hit with a large load all at once for a short period of time, okay. and then recharge rapidly. A deep cycle battery is meant to be hit with a a smaller load over a more extended period of time and then be charged up uh, less rapidly than say a starting battery is. So it's kind of the, the difference is, is that the deep cycle battery is like, you know, the, the, the freight train. It's, mm-hmm. it's pulling the heavy load for a long distance as opposed to like the starting battery that's, you know, it's more like the race car. It gets hit gotcha. with a big load, a lot of horsepower all at once to turn that engine over and get it started. Is that why you see the 12 volt used for the, the chassis batteries and the six volts used for the house Right, batteries? it's all about capacity. And the, the six volt batteries, two of them making a 12 volt battery has a greater capacity for the footprint than the a, a reasonably sized uh, 12 volt battery does for the footprint. Makes so sense. more storage. Makes sense. And then the hot topic right now with batteries is lithium. It's how long they charge, how long they run. What is What's some pros and cons to lithium? And are we talking like double the cost, quadruple the cost? Yeah, it, lithiums, uh, what I've noticed is, is that there's a lot of people that are new to market. And because of that, there are, are there's a lot of, um, I guess the people are, a lot of people are unsure uh, about the lithium industry because nobody's really been established in it for a really long period of time. So sure. we don't have a track record like, you know, with Trojan batteries or Interstate or some of these other big manufacturers, you know, it's a well-known name. It's been out for a long time. The, te- the technology is, it's established and proven. Um, and proven. Yeah. And so with lithium, it's a little bit different. Like we understand the concept of why a lithium battery is great and and how it works and and they can they maintain their voltage at a constant and steady level for a much longer period of time uh, over the time that it takes to discharge the battery and that's the great thing about lithium batteries is consistency when a lithium battery gets to a low state of charge when it's approaching zero the voltage drops immediately anybody that has a you know a a screw gun or a a battery operated tool that has a lithium battery knows that 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 battery performs at (laughs) at a very consistent level right up until the point that it dies and then when When it dies it's it's done done. you get to your last screw and it's just it's over sure um so yeah but the other great thing about lithium batteries is then they can be brought back to a full state of charge very rapidly they will accept a much higher charge rate and and amps and a much higher charge voltage to bring themselves back up than than the lead acid or an uh, an agm battery will and so for for those things they're great there are some performance issues at low temperature that most people will not uh, experience um, because you just don't get them into that low of a temperature. Uh, they can be mounted inside the cab uh, if you choose to. There's no gassing or anything like that during the charging and discharging process. Some of the downsides, uh, another, uh, I guess so before we get into downsides, another upside is weight. Like your, basically your power output to weight ratio is really high. They don't weigh much. They, they basically take up the footprint of a standard size battery and only because we've standardized the size of the battery are these manufacturers building them to that size like the interior space that 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 battery actually requires is much much smaller but because the industry is it has adopted certain sizes they're building those batteries in those sizes when in reality they really don't need to be that big or even that shape (laughs) <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're going to fit in your step well or they're going to fit in your bay. And right. They have specific places in every RV where you're right. They just 
make it that size now. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of really cool stuff about them, and I'm I'm really looking forward to you know when they there becomes some standardization mm -hmm. and uh, the technology is sure. a little bit more established. Um, one of the things that you can't do with a lithium battery is they they do not work well as starting batteries. They do not like having large loads placed on them for very short periods of time. Interesting. So yeah, because of that, yeah. you can't, you have to eliminate the start boost function on your, uh, on your big class A RVs. I remember us talking about that. We're trying to come up with a workaround on how we can incorporate uh, the two uh, because I think it's an important feature because the starting batteries have a constant load on them yeah. uh, that's unavoidable. And if your vehicle is parked for a long period of time without you starting it, right. eventually the starting battery uh, goes dead. And our fix for that on the lot is you hold the battery boost right. or the auxiliary start and then fire it up. Right, and so- It, it takes it, the chassis and house batteries- Ties them together, together. exactly. Gives you that, that oomph. And they don't like that, so, and it'll damage them. So what we have wow. to do when we install lithium batteries is basically disengage that function uh, of the coach. And like I said, we're kind of trying to work on a, a workaround for that. I'm, I'm a little surprised that more people haven't addressed that issue yet sure. as far as they're trying to sell this this product in the RV industry. So there are a lot of, a, a lot of benefits not uh, uh you know a lot of downside to lithium other than the the expense yeah, they well, they are very expensive but they also claim that the cycle life is much longer and yeah. so when you go to sell your coach if you want to take your your batteries with you and install them in the next coach then you can go sure. ahead and do that and they have plenty of life left one thing on that just to come back to that battery boost start which is strange because like i have in my truck it's a little lithium emergency start deal. So instead of having to hook up jumper cables and hook it up to another car, I just hook up the jumper cables and turn on my lithium battery and it jump starts right. my engine. And we have those for the bigger units on the lot, all the way up to these big diesels. And it's a lithium battery. It is. So how do, how come that lithium battery works to jump start, but the lithium battery that's in your house can't draw to your chassis to make it start? The only thing I can say is that it has to be something in the electronics package in those units that are specifically designed to jumpstart a vehicle. So it, 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 as far as uh, how that is accomplished yeah. is maybe a little bit over my head. The YouTube uh, <laughs> videos that I've watched. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> that's how you try. Well, we, we have those lithium right jumpers here. I mean, yeah. we, we have them. They're very expensive. NOCO makes them. They're about 1500 bucks, and, and they'll start a battleship in, yeah, in, in well. at zero degree temperature. It pulls the power together and gives it one big big burst but you're right it's it, it's designed to do that it's designed the ones to that do we're that we're talking about for your rvs at least not yet uh elon musk if you're watching this we're counting on you <laughs> uh they're not doing it yet but I, you're, you're right it's a matter of time before someone figures somebody it out. will figure it somebody slight, smarter than me will figure it out smarter than the two of us <laughs> So, okay, that's good. Now, you talked about the makeup of a lead acid battery. It's got lead plates, water in it, the, the, the glass mat, deep cycle batteries. It's in that, that glass material. What is the, the makeup of a lithium? If you battery? ever opened up a lithium battery, um, what it is is it is a multitude of small individual cells that are in series parallel circuits to create a certain predetermined voltage. So it looks like a it looks like a battery pack. I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the old lantern batteries that we used to get that had the little coily wires. I remember when I was a kid, we used to use them to launch our model rockets. And so yeah, they're they're kind of like when you open one of those up, what was inside of them looked like a whole bunch of double A or triple A batteries. It, it was a large rectangular battery with just a multitude of little batteries in it. Kind of the same thing with these lithium batteries. You sure. open the case up and there's just a whole lot of little lithium cells in there stacked on top of each other. Normally what, 100 cells, 170 uh, yeah. cells? Yeah, however, right however many it takes them to get to the amp hour rating that they're looking for and the weight that they're looking for that fits sure. in the package. So that's kind of the cool thing is, you know, they're they're only really limited by the amount of space that they, they occupy and the, the amp hour rating rating of the individual cells. So however many they can fit in there comfortably. Wow. Uh, yeah, and that's why companies like like Zamp is coming out with some some oddly shaped 
yeah. battery packs that don't fit the traditional footprint have a much higher uh, amp hour rating and then you can put them in, in your base. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's kind of similar to like what uh, Tesla does with a lot of their batteries and they're going into the residential uh, application for battery storage or for energy storage. Sure. And it's basically like a wall and you have these cartridges that are the, the power cells and you just you can insert them as you as you want to grow your capacity you can add to them so i think cool i think stuff. the rv industry is gonna gonna head that way but i think the biggest thing is 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 everything follows the automotive industry yep by and the rv industry <laughs> is about 10 years behind everything that the automotive industry does so as is, is it becomes standard practice in the automotive industry the rv industry will follow i think that's that's a safe bet yeah i think we touched really well on that i think the last last point i i i I frequently asked question is when you're storing your batteries for any of those three, do you recommend a battery tender or just completely removing the battery? What, what do you recommend people do? Battery tender is definitely the least invasive. Um, it doesn't, they're very easy to install in that it's usually a positive connection and a negative connection on the house and a positive connection and a negative connection on the chassis. And that's it. Removal of the batteries, uh, I don't recommend unless you really know what you're unless doing. you know what you're doing. And even having years of of, of replacing batteries, uh, upgrading batteries, I always draw a picture. I always mark the cables, and I I always take a picture with my phone. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, just to ensure that when I put the cables back on the battery, they go in the correct place. I couldn't even tell you how many times in a week I have somebody call me that tells and tell me that they were just replaced their batteries. They put them in exactly how they came out and now all these things don't work. Yeah. And clearly they didn't put them <laughs> all the cables back where they sure. belonged and now they're having trouble and and the problem is is sometimes if you you know, you, you put something to ground that shouldn't be grounded or you put power to something that should be grounded, you're going to take out circuit protection. Now, circuit protection in a motorhome could be anywhere in that, you know, 440 to 500 and some odd square foot package. Uh, and then sometimes it can be difficult to locate. Sometimes manufacturers don't always put it in the same place. So I would recommend, yeah, just being ultra careful, marking all your wires, draw yourself a picture, take yourself a picture before you even think about uh, loosening a single nut on top of the battery pack. That's really good. And if you're in doing your, your yearly maintenance on it, if you're do, getting a, a oil change or whatever, you, use that opportunity to ask your technician to. If you don't know, look it up and ask. And uh, I think we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. So Sean, let's move on here to wastewater system uh, in your RV. I know a lot of people where this probably stems from is it's winter time, it's up here in the Northwest. It obviously gets very cold. You don't want systems to freeze in the RV. So you winterize your unit. Then you go to de-winterize. And the question is, is this pink fluid that we're putting in it? Is this safe to drink? Uh, <laughs> what is the process? And why uh, we use use the chemicals that we do to winterize an RV, and what is the process for de de winterizing your RV? So, I mean, the process to winterize an RV completely depends on your RV uh, because not all all sure. vehicles have washers and dryers, dishwashers, and so on and so aquats. forth. But the, yeah, aquats. The basics being, you know, what does it take to properly drain the system? And that's basically opening all your low point drains. What what I usually start with would be pressurized air. Make sure you're blowing out all the lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, open all the low points. Make sure that the fresh water uh, tank is completely drained. Remove the filters if you have filters, whether they be for ice maker, whole house, or whatever the case may be. Uh, what I usually do is take the filters out and put them in, in an open plastic bag in the sink where they can dry out. You know, and if you if you choose to to reuse them, if not, that's a good time just to once a year change your water filters out so you don't get anything growing in your water system. Mm-hmm. Um, basically for the fresh, fresh water side, that's kind of it. If you have an appliance, you have to winterize, you know, like a dishwasher, you pour some of the propylene glycol into the system, you put it into a condition where it's going to rinse or, and, and pump the system dry. 
and it'll pull it through the impeller fill the pump and then you don't have to worry about it freezing same thing with the washer dryer you just put it into a condition where it'll drain and spin it pulls it through the pump and and it'll pump some of it down into the p-trap and then you pretty much essentially uh winterized your washing machine um water heaters basically you pull the plug drain the system if you have a bypass that's a good time to set the bypass into the uh, into the bypass position so that uh water air or um uh, rv antifreeze should you choose to pump it through does not try to fill uh, the water heater up to its capacity, five or 10 gallons or whatever it may be. In aqua hot, they do require that you put propylene glycol into the coil on the, for the hot water uh, production on the aqua hot. So basically the way you do that, you can go to the water pump, disconnect uh, the, the input side and run it into a gallon container, open up the nearest uh, hot side faucet. And once you see pink coming out of it, with the pump activated, then your aqua hot is winterized. Um, so yeah, other than that, that's pretty much it on the, the fresh water side. And then uh, on the wastewater side, with the gray uh, system, make sure your black tank's dumped, make sure your gray tank's dumped. And then what, what I do is, is pour a, a little bit of RV antifreeze into each one of the sinks. That'll fill up the P-traps and ensure that uh, they displace any water that was in there so that uh, you don't get any freezing of your drain pipes. Uh, usually a gallon uh, down the toilet. And so what that does is with the valves closed is it backs up against the valves and basically ensures that any water that was left in the system isn't going to uh, be up against the valves and the, the discharge plumbing and cause it to rupture. Um, we see that quite a bit in the springtime, you know, people, that's when like the, the, the damage that was done over the winter becomes apparent when people try to yeah. dewinterize their coach and go out and use it for the first time and all their fresh water stuff leaks or water heaters sure. got a crack in it, you know, and, and all the waste water's pouring out the bottom of the coach and it, it, what could it, it becomes if, a big deal and costs thousands yeah. of dollars. You have to redo plumbing on an RV. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and improperly winterized aqua hot will cost you between 10 and $12,000. Yeah, that's another just preventative maintenance of, of ownership of an RV. You got to make sure and keep an eye on the weather. And uh, as an alternative, so that's if you're really storing it, right? If you're using it through the winter, if you're living in it, uh, is it just running all the systems and keeping water moving through it that's going to prevent that? Or even then you should consider it? Uh, I mean, if you had to live in your RV in inclement temperatures, which um, last People week, do. for those of you who weren't aware, Texas had a huge nasty snowstorm yeah. and we were inundated with phone calls about furnaces about you know people that never had to worry about winterizing their motorhome or worry about things breaking pipes freezing stuff like that suddenly we're very concerned about it right. and rightfully so uh, and so we took a lot of questions fielded a lot of questions and uh right along these lines so if you're going to live in your coach in extreme conditions and i'm talking about where it's going to get below zero at night below 10 degrees at night most of these units were not meant for those kinds of you know temperatures they They're were meant, meant for people to hop in them and chase after the sun right, right exactly so. you point your wheels in a direction where it's sunny and step on the gas That's right um but in these cases where these people couldn't do that because down trees power lines right. things of that nature right it becomes uh, essential to make sure that first of all, you're, you're carrying a decent supply of fuel. Uh, your aqua hot system, if your coach is so equipped, will not operate be below a quarter of a tank. Neither will your generator. And it's done that way by design so that if for some reason you ran yourself low on fuel, you would still be able to start your engine and go get more. Uh, so propane, similar make sure your propane tanks are topped up and whatnot because you're gonna have to run your furnace all the time yeah. there's really no option for for not running uh, the furnace so basically set your thermostat to at least 60 degrees whether you're going to be in the coach or not if you choose to leave at any point uh, during the day and leave your coach alone you know set it to at least 60 degrees if you have the opportunity if it's going to be in the same place for long enough to block in or insulate the bottom of the coach so that wind cannot, you know, the air can't freely pass back and forth under the coach because that'll sap a lot of the, the heat energy that you're producing, then, then you should do that. 
uh, small ceramic heaters if you have access to 110 volt power uh, and, and you can clear out a large enough area inside the cargo bay, you know, and set that thing down to like 50, 60 degrees. So it's coming on now and again, that most likely will help keep your, your black and gray and your fresh tanks and your water lines and stuff like that from, from freezing, you know, uh, open up a cabinet door under a sink. If you're worried about pipes freezing, just so some of that warm air can get under there and circulate and uh, keep those things thawed out. Now, in the most extreme of conditions, uh, like so let's say that you want to take your coach skiing for the weekend, uh, which I've done extended elk hunting trips and things like that where it was below zero at night and mm-hmm. some ski trips up to the mountain here locally. Oh, um, I was at the mountain this weekend and it was packed with RVs. I right. Mean, absolutely packed in the parking lot. Yeah, and so what do it. I don't know what how they're doing it, but how I did it was I would buy a five gallon case of RV antifreeze. Uh, you're not taking a shower because you don't right. want water in your in your yeah. waste tanks, and you don't want water in your fresh tank or any of your pipes and whatnot. So basically, I would take the RV antifreeze, put it in the shower, and use that to flush the toilet there you go. and so you can still use your toilet you're not adding anything that's going to freeze into the system there basically and then up by the sink so it's up off the floor i'd get a couple of the the two and a half gallon uh water jugs that have the little dispenser on it if you want hot water you boil it obviously you're not going to take a shower or anything like that with it but you know at least you have hot water hot cocoa coffee whatever you can cook your food in there yeah. and whatnot and that's, I mean, it's pretty comfortable until sure. until you get to getting a little ripe after. Until you need a shower. <laughs> yeah, until you need a sure. shower. But most of those places, they have a, a shower right. that's available. So right. it doesn't that, become a huge that, issue. And that's only the most extreme. Yeah. And if you do it differently, if you're going up to the mountain on the weekends and, and you do a different system, we'd like to know. So I'll put it in, your, in the comments below this video. And I'm curious to see what kind of responses that we'll get from that. But uh, yeah, very cool. I know uh, w- with that then, so we're winterizing it, we're keeping the units safe. It's time to, to de-winterize. People are very concerned about safety of, you know, that pink fluid and what does that process look like? You got the ice maker, you got to clear out. How do you, or how do we at Beaver Coat Sales de-winterize a unit for a customer? Uh, basically, it just involves uh, going in and closing all the low point drains off. Uh, going in, taking the water heater out of its bypass mode, uh, putting all the filters back into place, putting fresh water back into the system, Mm -hmm. getting everything pressurized, checking the function of all the appliances, making sure that we don't have any leaks, things of that nature. And then as far as the, the... the winterization solution is concerned the propylene glycol is non-toxic i mean essentially you could drink it it's going to give you a belly ache and probably some other side effects we won't get into but uh <laughs> it, it see won't your doctor before yeah. drinking. <laughs> it's not going to kill you uh it tastes bad uh i usually throw out the first three or four batches of ice uh that'll come out of the ice maker you know run a gallon or two of water through um the refrigerator just to make sure that on the fresh water uh, dispenser side if sure. you have if you have one that you're not getting any more pink stuff out and just pour it down the drain it, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt you it doesn't hurt the water pump it doesn't hurt any of the features of any of the appliance that it comes in contact with uh so it's it's pretty safe stuff that's good there are different grades of rv antifreeze the only thing i can say is you know try to stay away from the alcohol based ones and try to stay into the propylene uh glycol based ones whatever your favorite flavor is right it's all pink but I, i've never tasted it to see if there was a difference in taste should we do a video should we do a maybe. blind taste test <laughs> yeah. maybe we'll talk to our producer and see if that's something we could put together yeah <laughs> okay sounds good so with that last last note on that if they are concerned if customers are concerned from a sanitation standpoint maybe it's not just after dewinterizing and all that but it's actually traveling around to different rv parks you don't know up here in in the northwest we got a lot of a lot of mountain water and yeah, it's, it's good it's, water it's, it's all good stuff up here other places you might go into cities and don't like the chlorine taste or whatever what are some good uh sanitation methods for your house water system i would say if that's a concern primarily i would get a a large standalone water filter 
that goes in between the the water spigot and your coach so basically you're filtering the water that you're putting in your tank i know that on uh, many occasions we have uh, contamination that could be due to biological agents sure. it could be due to sedimentation or it could be due to chemicals that you know whatever that municipality is you know adds into the water system mm-hmm. um, there are different levels of filtration from osmosis back to just a you know a different level Levels of like micron that'll filter out different types of materials and then there are some that just basically kind of clean up the taste and whatnot and those are mostly like your charcoal filters and whatnot but uh, yeah so it just kind of depends on on how sensitive you are to those kinds of things what kind of, of water you think you're going to be putting in your tank um, just kind of depends on what type of uh, a filter system you're going to install in your coach but it's never a bad idea to have just a standalone water filter that goes between the faucet and the coach. It's not going to really restrict yeah. your water flow or anything like that. And it's a good preventative measure to make sure you don't get algae and things like that growing in your water. And we see a lot of those as well. Oh yeah. Every, every, every summer we get uh, issues when primarily the first complaint is, is that uh, somebody has restricted flow and it's usually on the operation of the pump side and and sometimes it's on city water as well just depending on how the filters are inserted and then we'll pull the filters out and they're literally green and furry Uh, like it's yeah uh, it it looks like the stuff that you find in the in the river that you definitely don't want to drink and it has a very strong smell that's gross (laughs) yeah (laughs) you're like no wonder your water tasted funny yeah yeah (laughs) yeah so it's just for you know 50 bucks you can probably save yourself a lot of heartache and throw a filter on it now how often should it be uh replaced because they do come with house filters these, yeah you know, the majority i don't know what rvs don't but at these, the very least i'd say annually yeah yeah good that's what i need and now there's a filter for the refrigerator and a re- filter for the whole house same thing with the fridge just Correct. replace them both i would do them i would do them annually 10, 16 bucks something like that some of the in refrigerator types that are actually made by the manufacturer they're um, a little bit more expensive sure. but it's still it's worth, it's it. worth it yeah okay that's really good our house, uh, in our fridge in our house, it's got that light that comes on that says replace, and then all you have to do is just reset it, and then the light go, stays away for about a year, and then it comes on again. Mine does the same thing. It's the weirdest yeah. thing. Four or five times. Yeah, our, our water's starting <laughs> to taste. I might I might have some of that green stuff building up. I'll check that. Okay, well, uh, I think that's, that's, that's pretty good. If you have any more questions uh, that need some follow-up, or write in the comments about any kind of sanitation, any of the, the things that we've listed so far here, but speci- specifically with sanitation on the RV, if you're using a re- reverse osmosis system, if you're using a filter that you like, uh, send a picture or a link below. We'd love to check it out. Next up, we have brakes. Let's take a break for a minute here and talk about brakes. Excellent. So with your RV, I mean, are they going to... Are they going to squeak really loud like your car? Is that how you know that you need brakes? Is it part of the yearly check-in? How do you determine uh, when you need brakes and how does a customer know? Uh, Besides the obvious uh, running through a stoplight. I would say reduced braking ability would be primary. What's the first indicator? Yeah, I mean... I don't know how some of these systems get to the point they do when we find them, um, how there couldn't have been indicators, uh, you know, previous to. Sure. The only thing I can think is that, that the, the braking ability was lost so gradually over such a long period of time that the operator didn't notice. As in, you just have to push a little harder, <laughs> Right, just a little a little harder, takes a little, little, little longer, longer and, it, and a couple feet becomes 100 feet, and, you know, yeah. over time. So, because I don't think anybody's intentionally going out there maliciously not having their, their brakes right. looked at because they just don't want to have them fixed or they're intentionally endangering anybody. But I have seen... Uh, every season since I've been doing this, somebody will come in and and ninety percent of a rotor is missing. Oh, uh, that you'll I have. I've seen some nasty ones. Back oh there. yeah, really? large How chunks are, are just missing. They're just not even there. Um, they have become molten material at one time and f- and been thrown off into the frame rail. I've seen that cause fires. Uh, we used to have a system called Meritor Wabco back in the early 2000s that were infamous for not having the proper uh, brake proportion for front to rear. They usually are 60 front at least and 40 on the rear, and they didn't have the proper brake cans in the front, and so the rear was doing all the work, and Yikes. the rear got hot and got Yikes. molten and was throwing molten material into the frame rails. 
uh yeah so it it it's it's real it happens no joke you definitely want to be at least looking at them doing a visual inspection at least once a year if you have somebody going over under there to do an oil change just make sure while your technicians under the coach that they're inspecting the brakes there's there's if you look at a rotor there are going to be some key indicators that you've had some heat issues one of them is bluing uh, discoloration they should kind of be a shiny and consistent silver tone if you see reds and blues and bright colors and stuff mm-hmm. like that you're having some thermal they issues got, they got hot they got hot a couple times you may not always smell it uh, the rear brakes are a long ways from the cab you might may not smell them when they're getting hot so that's not always sure. the best indicator um, then you have uh, what we call checking checking are small uh, cracks in just the surface area. Basically, it's the contact area of the rotor. They don't penetrate all the way through uh, the rotor material, so they're not really compromising it at that point. It's just a, an indicator that you've had some some heat issues. Those those rotors are probably original, or they're, they're fairly old. Uh, and at that point, it's not an emergency to get them replaced, but I mean, at that point, I would say you need to take a good hard look yeah. at them and make sure that those cracks don't go all the way through. And then we have what we call cracking. And basically it's pretty self-explanatory. There's a crack <laughs> that penetrates all the way through the surface area and all the way to the backer and it's and it's completely through. And if you shine a flashlight up against it, you're gonna see daylight, you know, out the other side. That Jeez. That's serious. At that point, it is definitely time to uh, replace your rotors. Uh, pad thicknesses vary, so it's very difficult to say, oh, you know, what percentage of pad do I sure. have left? Different manufacturers have different specifications for, you know, the pads when they come out of the box. Some of them are a half an inch thick. Some of them are an inch and a half thick. It just, you have to know what you're looking at in order to know what the percentage of, uh, of break is left. Now, what's your pro- policy with the boys in the back here? Do you have them check on every RV when it comes in? Is that part of your... 14 point inspection or is when they when there's when an ask. when there's an oil change uh that's part of the 14 point inspection okay. i mean it's in our best interest in the customer's best interest to check those units as they come in sure. it's you know I, i'm not um to the point where i'm forcing guys to get under and look at brakes right. but uh but we we like to do an under chassis inspection on every coach that comes in and that that's not necessarily i mean part of it obviously is we're trying to generate some work for the shop but we're we're not and we're not selling somebody something that they don't need. I'm not going to look under there and go, "Hey, your you know your brakes are checked. You need to replace them right now." I'll tell you that they're checked and that you need to you know continue to monitor them. Sure. And if those that checking becomes worse or if it turns into some cracks that go all the way through, you definitely need to get it addressed. So it's not a you know we're not going to hold you hostage if your <laughs> if your yes. brakes are, are serviceable, we'll let you know. If they're not, we'll let you know. Uh, if if they're bad enough and you still choose to leave, I'm probably going to have yeah. you sign a waiver saying that you know we informed you that yeah. your brakes were at a dangerous level. But I recommend um, never going down hills. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing though that a lot of people miss and we haven't touched on yet is uh, brakes are a wear item. So the more you use them, obviously the faster uh, they're going to go away. And so the way that you can avoid that, uh, for one, is don't put yourself into situations where you're going to have to do a lot of heavy panic braking. Right. Uh, Stay then, in Nebraska. Then no se- yeah. If you're there, don't leave. That Secondly, thing. use your auxiliary brakes. That's what it's like, for. Use your Jake brake in, in cases when you don't even think you're going to need it. Uh, we can get a set of rotors up to about 900 degrees Fahrenheit in about three or four uh, just regular highway Jeez. stops out here on the highway. That's you know, a lot you don't of think. 64,000 pounds fully loaded on some of these 45 footers. Yeah, and they don't have any recovery oh. time because you go to a red light. And you have to hammer the brakes right. and then you take off again and, and, you know, a quarter mile down the road, you yeah. have another light. And so there's no, there's not enough time in between your normal braking to allow all that heat to dissipate sure. and allow the rotor to cool back down. Like, will it take it? Yeah. Is it bad for it? Yeah. You're probably going to catch that smell most yeah. of the time that indicates your brakes are hot when you're in town. I would say the only condition that I don't have at least the, the auxiliary brake in the low position position is if I've got the cruise control on and I'm going down the highway. And even then, cruise control is going to uh, overpower your auxiliary brake. So if your auxiliary brake is on, or your, your jake brake or engine brake, if it's on and you got cruise control on, 
cruise control will stay on until you you disengage cruise control and then re you'll remember that it's on because it'll engage and you'll feel that <laughs> kind of uh, it pulling you back and the engine working against itself to allow that but man there's been times on trips especially going down south where i drive miles and miles and miles and miles and i never tap my brakes until i'm actually ready to stop because those engine brakes will slow you down to 15 miles per hour before they disengage. Oh, yeah. I've and felt at 15 some. miles per hour, you're able to use your regular brakes just fine. Some of them are so effective, you feel like you're going to get thrown through oh, the windshield, yeah. when they're, especially when they're in high. <laughs> so they work really well. Past Hoodoo, when we're headed over to, like, uh, Sweet Home for the Country Music Festival or whatever, it uh, on that steep grade, you just flip it in high on a couple of these that have two stage, and it's amazing how much those slow you down. By the time you hit that steep corner, you know, you're still not even using your brake yet on a 54,000 pound rig. Yeah, I never turn it off on that that entire trip. Yeah. I, I never turn the, the the auxiliary brake off. That's good. Okay, and now what's what's the difference for people who don't know between disc brakes and drum brakes? And Basi how long do they last? Basically, I mean, I, I have found that the drum brakes tend to last longer. Uh, generally, the components are have a, a much higher content as far as materials concerned they're much more robust the 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 friction surfaces are are larger in surface area and thickness the drums are much heavier you know much more material um so yeah i mean that's that's generally speaking drum brakes will probably last longer um more likely under super heavy loads uh you're going to get uh less residual heat from a drum brake because all of that metal just acts like a giant heat sink. There's a, a much larger area for it to dissipate. Um, on, on the RV side, um, yeah, on the, on the automotive side, it's it's a little bit different uh, design. Sure. The disc brakes, they use them because you don't get as much fade. They they recover quicker, things of that nature. The, the ABS systems are, are a little bit quicker to respond. But uh, overall, I think most manufacturers for for the most part they're they're running disc brakes uh some of them run uh drum brakes on certain chassis there's really technology is advanced to the point where there's not really a super enormous advantage over running sure. disc over drum uh sure. drum, either way is, is why good do you stuff. why do you see disc brakes on the rear and, and drum on the front or vice versa on rvs what we used to see was a lot of if you had drum brakes they were either on all four corners or they're on the rear and that was pretty much it. Yeah, I, I think that's mostly because they're counting on you know that that large surface area, the large uh, amount of material, and being able to deal with large amounts of stress and large amounts mm -hmm. of heat and slow that that big vehicle down for longer periods of time than than the disc. I mean, now the disc brakes, the, the technology in the, on the RV side anyway, is is advanced to the point where it used to be that people would not. We had customers that adamantly would not want disc brakes on their coaches. Yeah, and that was just I think it's more of a personal preference thing, and that was that was based on on uh, the past history. Mm. You know, the the disc brakes were not always maybe uh, engineered or had the um, the experience out on the road, and then people were kind of wary of it. It's like, yeah. oh, it's something new. Like, I'm not gonna mess I don't want to do brakes. that. I don't want to be the first. <laughs> Nobody ever wants to be the first to go. So, yeah, I think that was a big part of it. it was just the stigma. But I don't think that it's has a you know it's not reflected in reality. Um, sure. Definitely, I wouldn't shy away from driving a rig that's got four disc brakes anymore. Now that and when we're talking about engine brake and exhaust brake, we're talking about diesel pushers. Right. Uh, what simply what does air brake mean? Because we talk about air ride and air braking system with diesels. If you don't, if you have a, a gas. RV, you're not going to have. Oh, that. like what, like the the mean? different systems of actuation, like right. So. You either have hydraulic, you have air over hydraulic, or you have air actuated. Air is basically direct chassis air is is actuating the brake system. It's running off of the air compressor, which runs off the brake tank, which you know runs off of the the uh, the brake pedal assembly. Hydraulic air over hydraulic is similar other than it uses an air canister to actuate a, um, a uh, brake master cylinder hmm. that's similar to like what's in a car. So it's not uh, actuated direct off the brake pedal uh, because diesels don't generate vacuum like uh, a gasoline engine does. It's basically that's your power brake booster. 
is that air canister. And then straight hydraulic typically uses a, a 12 volt actuated pump system and your brake pedal is kind of like actuating a switch. And that turns on a pump, pump builds pressure and it sends that pressure back to all four corners and that's what stops your vehicle. As far as efficiency of operation, straight air mm -hmm. is the best. Air over hydraulic is, you know, the next uh, preferential and then uh, straight hydraulic afterwards. Got it. Uh, usually the straight hydraulic coaches, you can kind of tell you get a little bit softer feel. They don't break as hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, it mm -hmm. works and they've been using it for a long time. Now in, we talked about like the exhaust brake for diesel pushers in gas coaches what blows me away is like driving up to the lakes and the we, we take some classes here and go up to the lakes in the summertime with friends and family and i always put it on tow haul and breaking down the hill how, how is that system work because i'm blown away by just how well they break going down the hill and kind of holds at whatever speed you're at in that tow haul mode how does, <laughs> what, what's going on there why is that why usually the usually in the tow haul mode what it's doing is it's if you have you have an overdrive transmission which yeah. is basically like kind of a gear in between the gears it just eliminates that so basically you're staying in the in those gears for longer periods of time so yeah, it holds the rpm it holds the note yeah longer than yeah and some of that's in the modern transmissions are all electronically controlled and so basically it's set in the parameters that it's going to keep you under a certain percentage of load or at a certain rpm in a certain gear got it and so yeah so that's how it maintains like if you're hauling a heavy load put it in the tow haul mode if you have the ability to kick you know knock six gear out of the top end or something like that especially mm -hmm. if you're trying right. to descend a hill you can downshift and and that'll help as well yeah no, that's really good. And then last is with tow vehicles, because uh, most of most people have a tow vehicle with them. What kind of braking systems are available for your tow vehicle? What kind of systems do you recommend? Uh, what does that look like? Uh, most states at this point don't require you to have a uh, like a you know a a dinghy tow uh, car rigged up for brakes. Mm -hmm. Some of them do. Uh, there's this really cool brightly colored map of the United States and Canada oh, that I've tells you that. exactly which states required and under what circumstances. What's that one? There's one state that has no color on it. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're undecided. If, I, if, if, <laughs> if Jared's able to find that map, here it is right now. And it changes every I'm year. Gonna work, I'm going to put some work for our producer, Jared, on this. So that basically indicates where it's required. Um, and the different systems are, some of them uh, are active off the coach. So in other words, you depress the brake pedal, yeah. uh, you use an, a line that comes off of um, the brake canister back to the back bumper and then it goes out to the dinghy. So then it uh, basically actuates an air driven cylinder which pushes directly on the pedal. That's the brake master system sure. uh, by Roadmaster it works that way. And there's a couple other ones out there that do too. Uh, then there's a, a different type of system. Like let's say that you like that system and your tow car already has it and you buy a coach that has hydraulic. They make a kit that you can install that works off of brake, uh, hydraulic brake pressure, activates a switch. And then that activates a compressor, which, you know, basically does the same thing. It depresses the uh, brake pedal and causes you to stop. Then they have some electric versions like the brake buddy where it's like a little suitcase guy and it drops in between the driver's seat and the brake pedal and when it sees a brake signal it pushes on the the pedal and that's what uh, actuates the system there's another one uh that i like that's called the invisa brake and the reason i like it isn't necessarily because it's easier for us to install or that it's you know it's uh it's invisible it, yeah or that it's invisible but uh, the way that it works is kind of cool in that it has its own little um its own little internal system that you can adjust the pressure on when it sees a brake pedal signal it applies pressure to the brake pedal and it's kind of stashed underneath a, a seat or where the spare tire goes or wherever that uh wherever you can find the best place for it and it has a pulley system and it pulls against the the pedal and pulls it towards the firewall and that's what uh, actuates the brakes neat thing about that one interesting is that you can it doesn't matter what kind of brake system the coach has 
the car works the same. Oh. And so there's no taking parts out or putting parts in or anything like that. Once yeah. it's adjusted and set up and installed, you're you're done. Uh, the only caveat That's being cool. that um, that you may have to unhook it if you have adjustable pedals in your car or it can cause uh, some issues. But other than that, it's it's pretty a pretty dumb. bulletproof system, yeah. So brake buddy, Invisibrake, Air Force One. Air Force One, one system is really good. It it works off of the uh, the coach as well. Okay. So anything that has air brakes, and a lot of them are pre-rigged for them. Uh, the the towing vehicle uh, usually has a a small canister that will work as like a breakaway system. If something happens with the coach brakes, it'll still be able to actuate the tow vehicle brakes and and safely bring it to a stop. Perfect. Okay. So those those three. Uh, I just want to make sure I got them right. I got Visa Brake, Brake Buddy, Air Force One. What was the other one? Uh, that we sell the Invisa Brake. Are these the three that we sell? Uh, those are probably the ones that we sell the so most of. Yeah. It, well, they used to. We used to have one that was very very popular called the M and G Brake System, and that worked off of the the air system off of the coach as well. But it, a lot of the vehicles now, well, it, you. What happened essentially is that the automotive manufacturers started building the uh, engine compartments into such a condensed form sure. that there simply wasn't room for it anymore <laughs> because it, it went in between the brake booster and the master cylinder. It was a really great idea, super simple, pretty much bulletproof once you got it all set up. Uh, and, and it made no discernible difference in the coach braking. It was very easy just to hook and unhook an airline. And then everybody just kind of redesigned the cars wow. and it's not applicable for as many units as it used to be. Wow. Well, what I'll do is uh, let's just put up some pricing here for those three systems that we sell the most of. Uh, that way you get an idea what those kind of kind of looked at look like and insulation is an estimate so uh for the labor cost on that it's going to be you know give or take 10 percent, right it totally depends on the vehicle some of them are pretty straightforward uh some of them are are nightmares uh, frankly <laughs> rigging some vehicles to tow requires removal of all of the fascia the front fenders the yeah. headlight assembly the grill and and it's kind of couple, shocking. Couple I don't recommend you pay. come down when we're in the middle of it because you don't. It's like op waking up in the middle car? of surgery. You know, yeah. You, nobody wants to see that. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Well, great. Well, that those are uh, some of the top five in no particular order questions that come up again and again and again with RV owners. We have uh, another five questions that we'll jump into uh, at a following video than this. But we we uh, this is a good amount of time here. Been about an hour. Uh, give you five of those so stay tuned if you have any questions or anything that we didn't mention here uh, Let's make sure to jump uh, right in the comments below and we can we can get that but just a little sneak peek for what we're going to talk about in our next service seminar where I go over clean and treat your slide outs and seals what that looks like uh, changing your oil uh, recommendation for uh, miles and and what kind of oil to use there replacement filters maintain your awning what that looks like in that process is and tow vehicle electrical systems uh, so anyway if you have questions on those stick around and be looking for that video to come and thank you for spending time with sean lakin and myself at beaver coach sales and service we look forward to seeing you down the road thanks sean oh yeah no problem i'm come looking here. forward to Don't it leave me hanging. Good job. <laughs> thank you look at you knowing things <laughs> This is fun.